This is an Inside Jerry's Brain Call on Friday, February 8th, 2019. Uh, we are talking about unschooling, and in particular, and I'll, I'll open this up in just a second, but in particular, once you start thinking about unschooling creatively, it opens up these very, very beautiful design questions that I will, I will bring into the conversation. But we were just about to hear from Lars, who is in Copenhagen. Uh, is that where you are now? Yes, I'm at home in Copenhagen, Friday oh, night at 11 unusual. p.m. Yes, it's unusual, <laughs> but good for a Friday night. And I couldn't leave the, the unschooling topic uh, you know, alone. I, I, it was just amazing and a great chance to, to join you wonderful people. Uh, so I was actually on the way to bed, but this was like, hey, this is, it. This is super interesting. <laughs> Let me join this. Uh, sorry to intercept you on your way to sleep, but very happy to have you here. I, I, know, I know Lars through a group that's doing exponential change. Uh, I don't, Lars, do you want to give a little background about, uh, about that part of you? Uh, happy to. I am a Dane, as you can hear from my accent, and a, a father of two boys, seven and nine. Uh, so uh, learning and education is a very big topic i'm very passionate about learning i never liked schools though uh, uh until university where i could dive into what re really was my interest that was uh, you know the math and physics and all of that i, w I became a nerd and did uh, have been doing technology since then yeah but now it's more like the 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 value that technology can bring to humanity, uh, that's what interests me. So my technology background is, is, is really useful. Uh, and uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur at Corporate Careers. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Corporate Careers taught me that there's the life uh, is full of uh, limitations that are being created by us human beings, right? Um, the same that I discovered throughout the school system. I had similar experiences to Judith. I was, I was super bored in school, actually. Uh, and, uh, and, and, yeah. and my teacher uh, always told my parents, like, so Lars never raises his hand. So we, we're concerned if Lars knows, you know, the, 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 the topic. But when we ask him, he always has the right answer. So, so they just left me alone, actually, which was nice. And I, I, I really, I, it was just nice to be left alone, but it's super boring, right? So yeah. What, a, yeah. what a waste of time, right? <laughs> Everybody's time. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. Sometimes when I'm talking about education and I'm in front of an audience, I will say, uh, think back on your whole educational career, how all the teachers you had. Yeah. And, and think of a number that represents the number of memorable teachers you had. The ones who affected your life, who were especially good, who, who you know, uh, understood you, whatever it might be. But how, what, what, what is that number for your whole educational career? And usually, typically, it's between three and five. Yep, that's the number most say, people come up with. I would say three. Yeah, and I, mine is like four-ish, I, I think. And I, 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 if I go to grad school, it, I, I add a couple more. Yeah, um, I, I went into the grad school realm. I got up to six or seven if I included multiple undergraduate and graduate people. Yeah, and, yeah. And it's interesting because you continue to find mentors even after that. And, and so I could add a couple people who fall into that category in the 30 to 60 age bracket. <laughs> yep. yeah. it's, it's also really interesting because I just got off a call earlier that was about um, how work ate the world. Basically, basically, work. Uh, his thesis is that long ago, work was toil. Nobody really wanted to work, and through a series of things, including the Protestant work, work ethic and, and a, a Weber and a bunch of others, um, we basically idolized work to the to the point where work is not just instrumentally good. Work is not just maybe even satisfying, but work is sort of the supreme good and should be the goal and the target of your of your being. And we spend our prime hours at work with work colleagues, et cetera, et cetera. And he's trying to crack that thing open and, and sort of question it and, and question why did we let work, you know, eat our lives and what can we do as a countermeasure? Yeah. Uh, and it's really interesting because a piece of that has to do with, you know, play and learn. And then another piece of that has to do with learning. And uh, uh, 
a video I've been meaning to shoot, but I just haven't sort of gotten around to it. Basically, I have a Venn diagram with three circles, work, play, and learning. And way back when, if you scroll back through the little time bar, these three circles were completely overlapping. Mm -hmm. And we, we grew up in society doing what needed to be done for our, for our village. Uh, we, we, graduate, we got graduated responsibilities as a little kid. And in many places, not everywhere, but in many places, work was actually sort of fun. Like you, you got to learn, you got to be with everybody who, who mattered doing the thing that kept everybody alive, et cetera. And then through modernism and a bunch of other forces, these three circles became extremely separate circles in the Venn diagram. They barely overlap, which is weird because then work is not supposed to be play. You're not supposed to be humorous. You're not supposed to bring your outside self to work. These barriers are now falling, thank God. But, you know, if you look at, you know, Mad Men or or the organization man, or any of the, the prototypical or texts of, of uh, management, it's like, mm, this, is, this is very serious business. And, yeah. and then we separate out learning episodes where maybe you go to executive education or something, but really you, you need to know everything you, you're going to know for your job before you show up for your job. And there was a stage called university where you got that, right? Which is nuts too. So what I'm seeing that I think is healthy right now is the re-blending of these three, uh, three circles. Um, certainly work is more casual. Certainly lots more people are floating away from jobs where they have to be somewhere nine to five and put in their, you know, FaceTime and all that. And in some sense, when I talk about unschooling, I'm also talking about adults. I don't care about age group at all. In fact, yeah. one, one point I make early and often is that the compulsory education system, one of, its one of its multitudinous flaws is that it segregates kids into one year cohorts we call grades. And that in doing so, it right away snips away a whole bunch of abundance that's present in the room or in the school or in the town because when Susie teaches Bobby his numbers, she's learning and he's learning. And, and, that, and, and you know, when you get to school, it's like the, the fourth graders want to be sixth graders, but the sixth graders don't want anything to do with the fourth graders. For God's sake, no. Yeah. <laughs> right? Which is yeah. ludicrous, completely ludicrous. Yeah, so one of the goals and one of the design questions I have that we're going to hit in a little bit um, is like, well, how do we create learning cohorts that cut across age groups? Like, how do we make that work in some interesting way? Yeah. Uh, so go ahead, Judy. You look like you'd like well, to throw something out. example of that. Uh, in a, a small school that my daughter attended, um, which of course falls under the category of privilege, but it also offered the front and end care that I needed for an extended day and a variety of other enrichments. But one of the things that they did that I think was quite helpful was that they had structured roles of upper schoolers, you know, maybe two years ahead, work, fourth graders working with second graders on conflict management or mm. on experiments or on projects in the school. And so you got this sort of closer at hand role model than this teacher that's 30 years older than you, yep. who's kind of daunting. And, and that was a part of every student's sort of duty or role was to mentor or be connected up to a kid exactly. a couple years behind. Yeah, they had a whole code of behavior that was pretty progressive. Um, and I think it actually came out of ancient Jesuit heritage. A lot of the teachers had been Jesuitly educated. Mm -hmm. um, but it was fascinating and I was really impressed with the social value and responsibility that was being instilled mm -hmm. in how this works. You know, what is your responsibility as part of the class if you see something that's being, that's inappropriate or if you see something that get, might somebody get hurt or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that kind of social learning gets lost when the class size is too big. Yeah. And the teachers have election plan they have to plan to and somehow they think they have to teach to the test which isn't at all what the testing was ever intended to be about. Um, and it minimizes the student's ability to synthesize new information. Yep. Um, since you mentioned the Society of Jesus, I thought I'd bring them up because they, of the different Catholic orders, they were the ones about education more than anybody, right? Mm -hmm. And so lots and lots of schools of all different levels, universities, what have you, uh, all kinds of interesting things. Um, and there's very interesting stories about the Jesuits' travels in the world. Jesuits in Japan is super interesting. Um, there's, uh, gosh, I, I thought I had more about it there. But uh, Port, uh, Pope Francis right now is a Jesuit. Um, here's suppression of the Jesuits. Spain actually expelled the Jesuits. 
<laughs> you know, Spain was busy expelling everybody, but but I, I didn't realize they expelled the Jesuits as, as well uh, in 1767. So anyway. You know, I, intellectuals are always experimental free thinkers, though. Is that that's the challenge of of free education in the freest sense is that you question everything. You know, you it, it a fact is only a fact until you've tested it to make sure it really is a fact. <laughs> and I think that's a dimension of education that's gotten lost along the way in many instances. Oh, for sure. I, mean, I, I can remember people saying to me, you believe that? You know, it was a quizzical look from a teacher. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> well, we've, we've managed to politicize education. I mean, w one of the things that's, I guess, conventional wisdom among policy people and others is that, you know, give me, your, give me the child at age seven and I'll, I can mold the adult. And, and that then the institution of education becomes the political instrument for crafting the next generation's worldviews. And we've seen that over and over and over in culture after culture, right? And once you centralize the bureaucracy of education, one of my other problems with, with the compulsory education system, you have a channel through which you can force everybody to adopt a curriculum or to not do certain things or whatever. And one of my, you know, just in, in terms of- uh, it's going back to genetic history too. Pardon? In some states, you can edit history too. Well, that brings and us to the that brings us to the Texas School Board, exactly. which is one of one of my favorite dark subjects in this in, in this sort of whole world of education. Lars, I don't know how much you know about this, but um, there are you know hundreds of school boards. Uh, there used to be thousands of school boards that were extremely local. Now they've gotten kind of skinny down. But the mm -hmm. Texas one happens to have an outsized influence on everybody else because most of the school boards don't have a very big budget so they don't have any hands on deck to evaluate textbooks and do what a school board might be doing so they'll follow whatever the texas school board says and okay. so conservatives figured this out a long time ago so um, 10 of the 15 texas school board members are actually conservative uh -huh. and, and so when when history and science textbooks start to eliminate slavery or evolution uh, or, or do other kinds of things or even when the, when the books become pablum, when all the spice is taken out of the books, because I don't think I read a good history book until I was 35 years old. I, like most history is pretty much crap. Um, so, so part of the reason is the politicization of curriculum, which accompanies the centralization of curriculum. So, uh, so I, let me just pause for a second um, on, on this. And I'll, I'll walk into unschooling next, but just any, any thoughts in your heads right now? What's, what's, what are you thinking? Uh, Go ahead, Lars. I'm curious about the Copenhagen and European system because right. my education has been in North America, um, fortunately with a, a number of rather progressive groups, but also I was right. intrinsically rebellious. So I'm curious though, because I have a sense that there's a more holistic approach in Scandinavia, but I don't know for sure. <laughs> yeah, I keep I, I keep hearing that in Denmark we have one of the world's best education systems. So, I'm really sorry for everybody else if that's the key <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm really sorry, and yeah, it, it's it's a longer story. I'm creating a, a quite a significant for myself initiative to actually overcome some educational challenges we've had in the school system in Denmark. Um, uh, with uh, my oldest son in particular, but it's, it's a whole different story. But one thing that I, I wanted to kind of weave into this as a parallel, uh, when we talk about mentoring, uh, you know, younger, uh, the younger, uh, the next generation, you know, a couple of, uh, a couple of centuries ago, uh, maybe even not that long ago, we lived like many did, generations under the same roof right and that was kind of a pattern in around the world i believe yeah. right so the grandparents took care of the grandkids uh while the parents were in the fields right and uh, in, uh, at least denmark uh, has been an agricultural society you know for 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 centuries so it, it was a normal way of living and, and learning, right? So you would learn naturally from those older and younger. 
uh, it was a natural way of learning. And, uh, you know, and we, we kind of took all that away. So, you know, elderly generations are being put into elderly homes and the, the, the small kids are put into kindergartens and, 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 and the parents are just stressed and, um, overburdened and nobody gains from, from any of this, you know? So, uh, I just want to, kind of, <laughs> that's kind of what popped into my mind, uh, when I listened to you. So, but yeah, we may have a holistic uh, view on, uh, on education. Um, but it, it is for sure, uh, a system that was designed, um, decades ago, uh, to, to please to the teachers and to make life easier for the teachers, you would carve out these blocks of time so you could handle the planning of the teachers and their uh, daily life. Uh, but nobody really looked at, at the kids and, and their learning. Uh, so it's, it's, in my opinion, it's a disaster. And the more I think about it, the, the worse it, it gets in my head. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me let me talk talk our way into some of the things that the design questions that I wanted to point to, uh, but I wanted to get there a, through a little bit of exposition of unschooling and why and what and how and how I came across it in particular, which is through this essay called the Six Lesson School Teacher, uh, that was written by a retired New York high school teacher named John Taylor Gatto, and was published in the Sun, which was a a reader submitted essay magazine that I, that I used to subscribe to for a while, but the first issue of this I ever saw was the one that uh, Doc Searles actually mailed to me in the good old US Postal Service uh, with this essay called The Six Lesson School Teacher. And in The Six Lesson School Teacher, Gatto says, look, nominally I was your child's English teacher, but let me tell you what I was actually teaching them. <clears throat> you know, I was teaching them that I am God in the classroom, that only I determine what curriculum you will study, uh, you are being taught to surrender your will to a predestined chain of, command, chain of command. You will turn off when I tell you to stay in class where you belong, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and then other people piled on to this, <clears throat> uh, creating uh, this kind of rubric called the hidden curriculum of school or schooling. And it's called the hidden curriculum because the explicit curriculum is what we're trying to teach you. And it's funny that curriculum is the racetrack. So it's from, you know, it's from Latin, the curriculum. Um, uh, in Spanish, correr is to run. So you're, this is basically the race you're running in order to learn things is your curriculum. Um, and so the hidden curriculum of school basically adds then that, hey, we can reduce your worth to a grade or a test score. We're just never going to leave, leave you enough time to dive deep. Uh, we've designed the school around averages. This all, all by itself is a great digression. There's a terrific book, The End of Average. Uh, by, what's his name, Todd Rose. Uh, and uh, he basically says that, that thinking only in terms of averages has screwed up all sorts of things because there is no average. We are spiky. Uh, we have, uh, you know, that, that doesn't, it doesn't work as a good d description. So um, one of the things that critics of the school system have proposed is something called unschooling which is a very poorly named uh, discipline because you don't want to be the negative of something. Uh, the un or the non or the anti or whatever is just an unappealing title. Uh, so some people call it <coughs> self-directed education. So there's a group called ASD, the Association for Self-Directed Education, um, which is a very high function. I love them. Uh, sorry, the Alliance for Self-Directed Education founded in 2016, uh, Peter Gray, a psychologist who is excellent, uh, is, is the founder of ASD and- uh, I'm his biggest fan, I think. <laughs> I, I don't know, I think I'll give, you, I'll give you a race for your money on that one. But uh, um, here's, a, here's a collection of some, of it. he publishes a lot in Psychology Today. Yeah. Uh, so he's got a lot of writings about unschoolers and unschooling, uh, super, super interesting. So I think there's better- I, I like how he's challenging people's perceptions about it. Exactly. Exactly. And so, so unschooling is, in, in some sense, just anything that liberates you from the structures of capital S school. Um, and I read uh, John Holt's book. Uh, he, he wrote a bunch of books way back when, but in one of his books, he talked about the difference between a, a small S school and a capital S school, a little T teacher and a capital T teacher, for example. 
And a capital T teacher in a capital S school was the place you had to be. This is your assigned teacher and you've got to be in this school or we're gonna punish you or punish your parents or whatever. But if you, as you grew up, decided you wanted to go to a military school where if you did something wrong, they forced you to clip the lawn with like toenail clippers and that was your idea of a good time, Cool, that, that kind of a school should exist. And if it was your choice to be there, then it's kind of a lowercase school. Or, you know, look at guilds as schools or dojos, the metaphor that I'm using around Apkido as a school, right? So, so he, he doesn't say that there shouldn't be teachers, although um, I tend to prefer the word learners or learning to educators, teachers, or schools. Yeah, I, um, I will put a comment on that because to me, a school is a building. Mm -hmm. The purpose of the building is learning and you can teach. It's pretty hard to teach. It's a lot easier to learn. Exactly. And you just reminded me of another great design question around done schooling. And so one of the things that I used in an adult course on science and leadership was experiential, this, the cycle of experiential learning, which most scientists haven't heard of if they're not psychology people. But it's basically you have a premise, you design a, a way to test the premise, you do the experiment, you evaluate the results, and you start over. It's kind of a continuous loop because you look at what you learn. And that's what learning really is all about. And a lot of it was physical, not just intellectual, historically. You learned how to climb trees, you learned how to push a plow, you learned what to do with a bale of hay, in addition to learning why you did it that way so the hay wouldn't fall apart and you could get it to the cow or whatever. And we've changed our whole system to sort of try to funnel feed it as cognitive content or force feed it out of context so that it's not very interesting. I was greatly bored. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I don't need a person or this group to do this. All I need is a book. Let me have the book and I'll go read the book and come back. You know, it was kind of my attitude and teachers eventually just let me check out and do that at my desk. But it, it was a weird thing because I always had questions and they didn't have time for questions. They were too busy pushing. So I'm, I just went to force feeding here in my brain because okay. it's a good, it's a, you know, the force feeding of geese to make foie gras is actually a reasonable metaphor for what happens these days in our educational system. <laughs> yeah. Partly because everybody says, oh my God, there's so much to learn. So we have to squeeze it down into your, into your, you know, innards. Um, when in fact, um, a kid who's curious is going to absorb these things and build, build mental models around them. Because what, what generally happens with the force feeding is you cram for the test, you study for the test, the teacher's teaching to the test, you're packing as many bits of whatever as you can into your head, you take the test, God willing you pass, and then you flush the buffers because now you have to do the, th the same thing again and again for each of your new five or seven subjects, right? And so it's not actually building a context uh, there's some experimentation, but you know, you know, a lot of those budgets are gone, et cetera. And then what's interesting here is, and I'll stick with the slightly morbid analogy of foie gras, um, because there's a really interesting TED talk uh, about, um, about Eduardo Sousa in Spain, who basically um, sells foie gras, but he, um, he didn't like the, the cruelty of the way that foie gras was made. And so he went and he found a beautiful, beautiful place in Spain, a place that is like biologically super diverse, and he created heaven for geese. He made it so that this was a must stop stop for geese and that they would naturally fatten up. And every now and then he, one of them would disappear. It's like, hey, where'd Bob go? <laughs> and Bob just became foie gras. But he basically created heaven for geese, right? And this is, it's, it's, it's known as ethical or natural foie gras. Um, it is uh, expensive. It is a gourmet treat for people who like, you know, that kind of thing. But it's a completely different approach toward um, that whole process. And, and unfortunately, we're busy force feeding our kids knowledge, much of which they're never going to use, absolutely don't need. And then we're going to avoid somehow miraculously teaching them a whole series of skills that might really come in useful in their lives, like conflict resolution, how to have a good relationship, home budgeting, you name it. I mean, there's any number of things that we actually don't teach them. Here's an anecdote. My daughter got to college and we were big on letting her participate in whatever we were doing. She was the only woman in her suite of six at Yale that knew how to clean a toilet. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. She said, you can bet I'm teaching them fast, mom, because I'm not going to do it for everybody. Exactly. You know? 
we also knew how to hook up TVs and do a bunch of random things. And she was the only person there who didn't have both parents and grandparents settling her. And she called me and said, you know, I just want to let you know there are all these people here. And I said, well, do you think it would help be helpful if we came over? And she said, well, no, not really. I, I kind of know where I want to put my stuff. Well, why are you calling me then? Well, I just thought you should know because they're kind of asking where my mom and dad are. <laughs> I said, well, tell them we're off doing some. You know? <laughs> but it was just fascinating, that whole dynamic. And I did not realize until that moment that we were so different than a bunch of other people hmm. in what we thought was the natural way to operate. That's super interesting. I love that. Hmm. Hmm. Um, so let me click on the topic of this call, just, um, <clears throat> just so that we can dive into it a bit. And uh, what I'd love to do is add to this list, uh, explore the list. And Lars, in terms of the Educate for Life project that you have going, um, I'm trying to figure out how to frame my part of it so that I make room for answers to these questions. Lars, can you put your Educate for Life some sort of link to it in the chat so that it's available later? Very happy to, absolutely. Cool. Um, so, for example, one of my questions that came out of, um, uh, out of uh, unschooling and, and considering unschooling is, how do we find how do we form good learning cohorts for anything and and here the examples i use are i might want to create a learning cohort that's going to last one evening for two hours to learn to make cocktails or i might want to create a learning cohort to learn like conversational mandarin which might take five years and I, I want to be completely blind or indifferent to age differences. Uh, it, it could be that for Mandarin, a seven-year-old, a 17-year-old, and a 70-year-old might be just great in a learning cohort together, and they might not. And I, I, and I don't know enough about the kinds of chemistry uh, that it would take to form good cohorts. Uh, so uh, just for fun, I collect personality profiles in my, uh, in my brain. So here's... Um, <coughs> Uh, hold on, it's going to get really crowded in a second. Here are pers personality types, tests, and profiles. So <laughs> Myers-Briggs is buried in here someplace along with the right. Enneagram, uh, Fisher's four personality types, uh, five dominant personality dynamics, the five-factor model, which is pretty famous, FFM, the Kiersey temperament sorter, the Johari window, IQ tests, intercultural development inventory, yeah. the lusher color test. And this is just the P's. There's a scroll bar down here. <clears throat> so if I scroll to the right, you'll see there's a bunch more later in the alphabet. The Reese profile, socionics, scarf, status certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. Which of those motivate you? Et cetera, et cetera. So mm. uh, and, and why I don't, do we need tests? Par pardon? I guess I don't, I've never gotten why we need tests or why we need buckets in this sense. Well, uh, lots of people are trying to hack people. Like how do we become more productive? How do we perform better? How do we make better teams is a big one. I mean, Myers-Briggs took over a lot of companies because it was a, a method of saying, oh, okay, so you're, you're an ENTF uh, or whatever else. We should couple you with this other kind of person. And I don't know that there's any studies that have shown that this actually ever paid off. Uh, so here's a, an article that I saved from Vox magazine, why the Myers-Briggs test is totally meaningless, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Here's another article, say goodbye to MBTI, the fad that won't die by Adam Grant, who yeah. wrote about givers and takers and all, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I, I point to personality types for sort of two reasons, because it's kind of a, a two edged sword. <clears throat> On the one hand, there's a whole bunch of these, who knows which ones work, it's confusing yeah. and, and wow. <laughs> On the other hand, could we borrow from some of these things to create some, some sort of process that helps groups form well, right? That helps us create good learning cohorts, good teams, high functioning teams, and that helps these teams just improve over time. I'm very interested in that question. Like how, how, do, how do you know when you're in a good learning cohort? How do you improve that cohort's sort of functionality over time? I think that's a, uh, a really interesting design question. And for example, um, this is, this is, a, uh, this is going to seem like a strange example, but um, the game Fortnite is yeah. really popular right now. Lars, any of your kids playing Fortnite? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. My youngest one. 
Okay. But it, it's on the way out. There's uh, the new wave is coming. Something new. Excellent. Something else is going to take its, take its place. And, and yeah. Fortnite uh, is a battle royale game, which means the last one standing wins the game. And what's interesting about it is that it's, it's free to play. So you can just download the software and go play. But there's a whole bunch of stuff you can spend money on inside the game, <clears throat> which is why the average revenue per user for Fortnite is way higher than Google or Facebook or anybody else. They're making buckets of money doing this. Oh, yeah. But the way you enter a game is you go to a lobby and you wait until 100 people have collected up in the lobby and then all 100 of you drop into the new terrain and there's only going to be 100 of you in that particular game until it's done in a couple hours. So in, you know, in that time you have to try to hunt down everybody else and shoot them. How nice. Um, but what, what's turning yeah. out is that Fortnite is a social phenomenon. That Fortnite is becoming the place where kids hang out. Yeah. Right? It's the place where they, they sit and chat and they're treating the game as background entertainment. This is super interesting to me. And it means that we might need to look further afield for how do we form learning cohorts? Well, it might turn out that a really good esports team is a really great learning cohort um, and that we can learn something from those places. Don't know, but, but, but I'm, I'm really open to those kinds of investigations here. And partly I'm asking, should there be a service that does matchmaking like this or is this much better served as a practice as a, as a, as a method that people can uh, adopt and then they'll go find people in different platforms and places. Right. You, you were touched on a number of different perspectives to this and Peter Gray is one of them, right? If you ask him, he will say that oh, they will find their own way, right? They are going to find who they're going to learn from. Don't even touch them. Don't get in their way. <laughs> I, 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 I'm a believer in that. Uh, but, but if you live in, in our society with that belief, you will have a lot of enemies. You will have everybody chasing you because how can you leave your, your kids to just seek their own learning? You know, you've got to put them into a system of some sort. You need to feed them the, the, the knowledge. <laughs> Everybody's going to hunt you down until I you actually comply. Debate that with you. I mean, not that my daughter didn't go through all that, but I, I'm not sure we need to do it that way. But I have a, just a teaser for you, Jerry, in terms of Please. a matchmaker or something, because a wise person as a mentor once said, you know, this whole concept of mentorship is overly complicated. So it's really two things. If you see somebody do something that's very effective that you like, notice, yeah. figure out how they did it, and then try it. And if you see somebody do something that's terrible, notice and vow never to do it. <laughs> and to a large extent, that's social modeling. Because if you notice things that are effective, you're learning as an adult just by observing and you can explore it with that person if you choose to, or you can yep. find out by watching them do it more than once, you kind of break the code yep. and experiment. And part of, part of what I'm trying to overcome is our socialization or our reticence away from just doing what you just said. So once your, your boss or, or colleague had said, go do this, you were like, oh, that sounds like a healthy behavior. Then you started doing that. Before that moment, you're in a company and you don't know whom you should or shouldn't talk to or you're in a, in a, in a, at the supermarket or in a school setting or whatever it is, and there are rules and norms that kind of keep us separate from each other. Um, so part of this, and, and Lars, I completely agree with you, like we should, we should trust that people are going to sort this out and give them as much liberty to go do it in whatever way occurs to them. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to help more people realize that this is something they ought to be able to do and ought to try try to do and that permission to experiment in this direction yeah. is something I want to light up somehow. Yeah. I no, I, I understand. <laughs> I, I just want to say, yeah, I was, I was just touching on, on some other people's kind of, uh, you know, ways of describing how to learn, but, you know, essentially if we follow Peter Gray, just to stay with him for another one second, you know, we're going to li be limited to the people living just around us, I think, back to the old tribes and, 
uh, our world is is so well connected today. We have access to each other, like the three of us do right now, because of technology. And suddenly we get together in a split second with just the right people. Actually, uh, I'm I'm sure we can figure out algorithms and stuff to 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 kind of. Uh, uh, figure out who we are, what we want to do, what we should be doing, uh, which is what Sky Hive is kind of doing. Uh, you know, uh, um, the founder was speaking at one of our uh, community sessions. Uh, very interesting work, by the way. So, and then get us connected to the people that we should be learning from or with whom we should be experimenting. Uh, I, I think. I think definitely. There are a lot of services uh, that 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 needs to be created from here on. Yeah, absolutely agree. And 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 so partly I'm trying to, I, I, I'm trying to figure out how to get outside of the normal school paradigm of oh yeah. we have project based learning so let's create some software that does project based learning and sell it to a school district. I'm trying to step as far away from that as I can while still harnessing that, I mean like, great, so somebody's written good software that, that manages projects, that, that, sound, that sounds wonderful, but how do we step outside of the structures and assumptions of the school system uh, to help anybody who wants to learn, go learn like crazy? Right, oh, why, why do you need to connect with the school system? I don't, I'm trying to avoid it. Yeah, okay. You know, my mental model, and I think I've been brainwashed by the exponential organizations, but I, I, keep, I keep coming back to the, the, the model of the core and the edge, right? Mm -hmm. And I consider uh, the school system the core when we talk about education, and, and I want to avoid it as well uh, because, because I, haven't, I haven't really found much that was of value <laughs> in that system. Uh, unfortunately, uh, so I, what, what I think it's time to do is to create something new on the edge of that, which means let's just stay clear of, of the, the education system as we know it. Let's get as far away from it as possible, experiment with something new. It can be uh, all sorts of experiments for all sorts of reasons with all sorts of good people involved learn and see how can we create alternatives to the whole school system and some of these initiatives will die because they cannot work others will grow and families and uh, you know will will gather around the initiative that seems to be working and adding value and and, and essentially one day this is my big big dream it might take a hundred years to get there or 200 but my big dream is one day we can we can uh, replace everything that's known as the education systems today. We can replace it by a whole new paradigm. Love that. Um, I'm just catching it. Oops. <laughs> Sorry. Paradigm. <coughs> <clears throat> Love that. I, I, and, I, and I totally agree. Um, so let me go back to sharing the questions. And Judy, as you were talking earlier about a school is just a building, um, one of the questions that I don't think I have here. So a question I do have is if the kids aren't in these penitentiaries that look like schools, then where are they? Like, where does education take place? Where does learning take place? That is a question I think. But another question hmm. is um, what happens to school infrastructure? It needs to be built. Yeah. I, I'm very negative about infrastructure and institutions. I think the educational systems at all levels is very antiquated mm -hmm. and it's going to take an upheaval, which is starting to happen because of enrollment issues and cost issues and overbuilding of buildings and all kinds of stuff. But there's, it's time for a revolution. And I think, I think Lars is probably right. Although I, I'm hopeful that there could be a, a grassroots thing where what's best flourishes on its own. Mm -hmm. And just because it's good and works, others try to do it, and then it flourishes some more, and eventually it becomes a movement. Mm. Yeah. There's going to be tremendous resistance, though, because then you've lost that control of the population that you talked about historically. Right. Because the freely educated are very iconoclastic. Mm. I went to um, Copenhagen here because... Last time I was in Copenhagen, or maybe a couple trips ago, I visited a new school, an alternative school that had been designed as a big spiral upward. 
and the different the kids were mixed in in age groups but there was like a lower third middle third upper third and all the kids were just mixed into these different thirds and you moved your way up the school structure physically as you got older and, and kind of advanced through the grades and it, it, it was like the physical design of the school was trying to accompany open plan uh, a whole bunch of other things and I'm forgetting the name of it I thought I'd see it here under under Copenhagen but I'm not seeing it right now I'm seeing a whole bunch of other stuff um, but it was, it was quite interesting and uh, part, partly my answer to what happens to the school structures is um, I'm hoping that the schools the schools become um, venues that you can check out just like at a, any company these days there's a flat panel display by the door of every conference room and every lab and it tells you who's got it booked for the next hour awesome schools have yeah. rehearsal rooms with pianos in them they have biology labs with beakers and safety gear and and Bunsen burners uh, they've got you know stuff they've got playing fields for athletics <clears throat> that's terrific why don't we let anybody in the community come through and use them? And then a topic we haven't touched at all, which is I think uh, also needs to be on this list, is safety. How do we how do we make this whole thing uh, reasonably safe? Because we're talking kids, and I think one of the big reasons for preserving and even doubling down on the current penitentiary system of school design, uh, post Columbine and post all these you know shootings since then, is we need to actually turn these things into fortresses with armed people inside in order to keep the kids safe. When in fact, I believe that the exact opposite is, is true. Somehow, it, we probably could do with a whole topic of discussion, what is the key that opens learning? Mm -hmm. Because if you once get that lock open, it's pretty hard to close the door. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If your curiosity is assuaged or you're reinforced or whatever it is, at whatever age it starts, um, it's hard to put the genie back in the bottle. <clears throat> so if we could work on that unlocking concept um, or potentiation concept or whatever you want to call it, it, it applies at every level because people get really excited when they learn something new on their own. Mm -hmm. The aha, it's kind of like your two shits thing, Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> it's, I, I, I took that one away. I really like it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, and Lars, I can explain it in a second. Um, ahead, Jerry. Judy, I, I'm coming at this partly from the belief that children are naturally curious, that they're born curious, yeah. but we manage to socialize that out of them. Exactly. That, that by the time they even get to grade school, we have to somehow re-spark this love of learning and love of, of you know, being curious and whatever else. But, but that, the, that the compulsory school system, uh, yet another critique of it. I think it's instilled in preschool as it was with my daughter. She's very determined about protecting that. Mm -hmm. So she actually transformed her school to fit her rather than the reverse. That's excellent. And, and at every teaching point along the way, she was an outlier um, yeah. because she was so self-directed. And I don't know exactly how we did it. <laughs> I'm just grateful. <coughs> but it's partly because I had the same experience you had, Lars. I mean, if you're totally bored and you mm -hmm. have a lot of capacity, you find something else that's fun to do that's satisfying. And as you do that, you get hooked on that self-driven satisfaction, or at least I did. So if we could figure out some exercises that would allow individuals to experience that, I think that's far more, more inspiring and likely to last than any sort of institutional approach. Yeah, love that. Um, yeah. Let me backtrack for one second to describe the, the two shits to Lars for, for just a <laughs> <laughs> Lars, this comes out of my working on design from trust and then I, you know, identifying unschooling as being one category of things that are designed from trust alongside the sharing economy and microfinance yeah. and open source software and a bunch of others, right? I've got a whole bunch of examples that I curate in my brain. And what I've discovered is that when people hit any of these systems, 
uh, they very often have two predictable responses. The first one is, oh shit, this is impossible. What a stupid idea. I can't believe anybody's trying this. This will never work. Yeah. Right? Who is going to let you sleep in their bedroom and take over their house? Why would I step into a stranger's car? What do you mean nobody owns the software and it's just out there for anybody to, to look at, right? All these things yeah. provoke a very counterintuitive, there's a danger here kind of response that's either visceral, you know, your heart, your throat, clamp up, whatever it might be. And then at that point, you either a bail, you leave the thing because it's so counterintuitive and so stupid sounding that it couldn't possibly work, so you go away, or you try it. And many times when you try it, you begin to understand that something weird just happened because, oh shit, this thing actually works. Yeah. So that, that's the, the second shit is like, like, oh my God, this thing actually is starting to work. And, I, and, and yeah. we're not having that conversation openly about what made it work. Why does it work? What else works like this? How is that working? Which is why I'm doing everything I'm doing around design from trust. It's like, yeah. because I'd like more people to figure out that there are many, many systems like this that already exist and work just fine in the world. Occasionally we bump into them. And when we bump into them, we bark our shins and we're like, oh shit, this shouldn't work, right? Like Wikipedia, you know, if, if you had gone to a venture capitalist with, an, with a plan for Wikipedia in 1998, they would have laughed you out of, you know, out of their office. And yet there's this Wikipedia thing, which is always among the top 10 most trafficked websites on earth and is the only one of the 10 that does not leave any cookies on your machine. Yeah. Um, stuff like that. So, so that, that's partly that part of it. And now we can kind yeah, of wander, wander back and pull harder on the, how do we light up people's, um, because this is parallel to how do we light up people's love of learning again or whatever that is, because these sorts of, these sorts of experiences are an experience of personal agency. And one of the words I really like here is, is the sense of agency, which is the sense of, of responsibility and authority and permission to do something to improve your world. And one of my critiques of consumerism is that it removes our sense of agency. My job as a good consumer is to buy more stuff or to solve the problem through a pill or a service rather than designing or making or inventing the thing or, or, you know, whatever, or helping other people with the thing or whatever else we've, we've consumerized our way away from yeah. this sense of agency. And therefore, again, I come back to the question that Judy just asked, which is how do we provoke spark light up this sense yeah. that it's good to be curious. <clears throat> you can maybe experiment. There's a lot of stuff out there to fix. It's okay for me to try to do it. It's okay for me to ask other people. All those things that we've kind of broken. And it's normal for it not to work the first time. And, it, and it's unlikely to work the first time. So then just like yeah. figure out what, what, was, what was off and try again. But it is there. I, I mean, the, the, the older we get in a system that doesn't allow this, the more likely we are to lose it. But it, it is in us. And... and <clears throat> My kids are seven and nine. I see it all the time. They have it. Uh, and, but they, they need to seek it when they come home from school. because And then, then they would challenge themselves in Minecraft. Hmm. And, um, and, you know, uh, yeah, okay, I, I'll, I'll not take all, all your day with, with the story. but No, please do. Uh, yeah, no, it, it's, it's just you know, my, my nine-year-old. Um, he, he was he was the first one to learn to read in his class, even though the teacher said we cannot get in contact with him. The psychologist said there's something wrong with him, and so on and so forth. Right? Long story. We, you know, and and maybe there was he got a, this um, diagnosis of autism and ADHD. Right? At least it explains why he couldn't thrive in a noisy stressful school environment right but he is a bloody good learner mm -hmm. and the psych that one psychologist kept telling us lucas can probably not learn what he's supposed to learn <clears throat> and at the elementary school i said listen listen i, I mean I, I this is not an argument i'm just i just wanted to tell you that when he comes home he's uh, he's programming mods for minecraft he figures out the gravity level of gravity that that is needed, you know, to make sure that the arrow he's shooting in the game hits the right spot in the wall. He figures this out when he comes home by himself. He taught himself 
pretty fluent English in six months from YouTube. We don't speak wow. English at home. You know, so tell me again <laughs> that he cannot learn, right? And, and these are the, the people uh, monitoring the kids everywhere. And so so they, they have it, they, they have it and they exercise it whenever we give them the chance to do it. Uh, but we don't give them the chance to do it, right? right. That's the problem. Yeah, we, exactly. we are the problem. We are the problem. A, a friend, a friend of mine's, uh, I don't know, seven year old or something like that, little boy, was disciplined in school for fidgeting. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's like, man, what, what are we so doing? What are we doing? Yeah. yeah. So, so was mine until we, we went to this because my son has this. Uh, now we figured out he has autism and ADHD. So we were very lucky to have this course, a weekend course offered. We went there, a lovely couple, a uh, Danish couple teaching the, the, the man uh, has ADSD and, and the woman has autism. So they knew exactly how it feels like. Um, and, 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 and the first thing I learned, it's been a problem for a long time because when, when my son was sitting at his desk in the school class, he was, he was always, you know, he had to touch something. He had to... And, and, and I knew uh, from very early on, he learns actually best when he's uh, playing with something, right? Mm -hmm. But I couldn't explain it, and the teacher certainly didn't allow it. He has to sit still, don't touch anything, right? When we got to this course, this man that who was the, teaching us through the weekend, he said, you, you have to, you need to carry something in your pocket that doesn't distract the, the people around you. So it is secretly you can, you can fit it and you can do what you have to do because otherwise you cannot learn, you cannot concentrate, you have to do this. It's the only thing that works. And exactly, we started, uh, we found something that didn't take too much space. Lucas could carry this around, you know. And, you know, suddenly he goes quiet. He can fidget. He, he will focus on whatever task he has at hand. Everything works, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> but but yeah. don't, don't ask him not to touch something. <laughs> it's great. I love that story. Thank you, Lars. It's a beautiful story. It's really lovely, yeah. Um, yeah. A friend of mine, a grown-up friend of mine, when she attends a conference or whatever, she takes a large drawing pad and uh, pastels and sits on the ground and spreads them all out. And, you know, if, if it's the first time you've seen her do this, she will tell you, hey, you know, I, I've discovered that I'm, I have to do this so that I can be present for the meeting. Yeah. If, if I'm yeah. not just sitting here drawing and letting that part of me pay attention here, it all gets mixed up and I can't actually pay attention there. Um, but exactly. she, had to, she had to hack her own personality and skills, yeah. perceptual yeah. systems to get there. And I'm trying and to figure out how do we help everybody do that sooner in life? Uh, that, that's, that's a good question. But I, I just want to say, I think we are all hacking ourselves in some way. Some are conscious about it, some are not. And maybe we're not aware of how we need to hack ourselves. But sometimes, I, I, you know, I often go jogging on the beach here. I'm fortunate to live just by the beach here in Copenhagen now uh, and because I really enjoy it. And it's my reset. And I figured out that's my way of hacking me. Uh, I, I, I just perform so much better when I've done it. And, uh, and other, others have to do something else. But but this is what we should learn in uh, first grade. I think this is <laughs> who are you? Uh, how do you function? And and when are you not functioning? And and why is that? And how can we help you to hack yourself? And and you know, but but actually, <laughs> it's worked the other way around. We are being punished <laughs> for if if we are not compliant to what society demands of us, like sit still and shut yeah, exactly. up. <laughs> And, and there's, a, there's a sort of controversial topic of learning styles. Uh, and I had a call recently about this where a friend of mine who objects to the idea of learning styles sort of uh, educated me a bit about it, but I don't think I've internalized what he said yet. Um, uh, it was Clark Quinn who, who knows a lot about this. And basically one of the problems is that learning styles, they sound impossible in school because 
what do you mean this kid has to learn in a completely different way? I can't modify the curriculum to adapt nicely to what they want, blah, 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 blah. So, so within the school system as currently designed, learning styles sound like a complicated mess. In the world, if you know, I, one of the services um, I would like to have would tag up all the resources in the world by learning styles. Just meta tags, meta information, so that once I decide that I want to learn everything through musical metaphor, because I'm a really great musician and I'm not, but, but let's say music is my entryway to mathematics, which happens a bunch to people. Um, other people, it's, it's cogs and gears as they're opening to mathematics, right? They're, but different metaphors carry for us. Once we figure that out, why can't somebody have, why can't the crowd have helped us overlay on the world a series of meta information that guides us more rapidly to those kinds of resources. And this doesn't mean that forever in life we're going to be that kind of learner. I'm not trying to peg people in some way. I'm trying to facilitate their discovery of things that accelerate their learning. Hmm. So that's another great design issue. There Sorry, was an Judy. old dichotomy that was the dichotomy of do you learn by listening or do you learn by reading? that was one of the earlier dichotomies that was encountered in my world. Um, it turns out I can actually do both, but I thought I could only do it by reading. Hmm, interesting. So I listen to things and write them down because the writing down helps imprint them, but it's actually the reinforcement. Yeah. yeah. Um, one, one example that's also used is the difference between knowledge and knowing. And here the usual explanation case is riding a bicycle where I can have you read a book about it, you can watch a video, you can do whatever you want, and you will not know how to ride a bicycle until you've actually hopped on a bicycle and managed to balance it down the street, right? That, that, that there's a real big difference between having it up here and having the physical ability to, to steer and manipulate. And then a thing I realized about my use of the brain software is, and I've been using it for 21 years now, is that when I'm curating things into my brain, it forces me into system two thinking. So whatever I'm looking at, I have, to, I, have, I have to ask a series of questions. I mean, I don't have to. I just naturally go, is this worth remembering? If yes, hmm. where do I put it? Where does it belong? Um, what do I call it? What else do I connect it to? And then on those kind of fun days that are too distracting, oh my gosh, look at this shiny object over here. And then click, 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 zoom, 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 and like a couple hours have gone by. But that's a different story. But, but curating what I care about has been very helpful to me in going deeper on all of it and then in being able to find it later and then add to it, right? I think yeah. you're on an important thread because for me, it's sort of like chasing an idea and the idea can come anywhere. It can be a sentence in a novel that somebody else who read the novel doesn't even remember, but it triggered a thought sequence in my brain that then triggered another question that wasn't answered in the novel that I either dug out of my brain or I went somewhere to look something up or I made a note that I need to understand this <laughs> or I connected it to another book and I'm grabbing over here to see if I can find the quote that's relevant that's sort of adjacent to what I first read and the same sort of thing happens with music you know you, you get a melody stuck in your head and then it leads you to a bunch of other things. So I think that notion of metaphorical knowledge or something mm -hmm. or the linkages is an important concept that needs to be peeled down more. Mm -hmm. and, and my favorite thing is the sort of the connectivity between things. I'm a pattern finder. It's one of my superpowers is seeing um, and seeing and explaining how things that seem really, really different from each other are in fact pretty similar in, in, on some dimension in some way. And that can lead to lots of insights. It's, it's, it's one of my favorite things to do in the world. And it's something I'm actually trying to do more officially for more groups. So Lars, I don't think you know this, but um, I, I, you know that I own the domain jerrysbrain.com and insidejerrysbrain.com, which is the, the, the call we're in right now is part of Inside Jerry's Brain. I, I also bought the domain pickjerrysbrain.com. And I'm interested in being an on-demand uh, sort of brainiac coming into things like a Zoom meeting listening, participating, doing some screen sharing with permission during, and then possibly doing a five minute summary afterward of like what I, what I thought or what I would do in your shoes or whatever. But I, I, I think this is a new role that organizations could use. It's, it's um, I don't know, it's, a bit, it's part memory, it's part context, it's part uh, uh, devil's advocate. 
I think the connectivity Excellent. is a very important word. I'm sorry, Lars, I'll, I'll stop in a second. No, which, which word? No, no. Connectivity. Yeah. Because one of the things that I discovered much more clearly after I was retired and not having to do, produce work product all the time, and also not having to problem solve for a million people all the time, um, was that what I was really interested in pursuing was the connectivity of everything. You know, basically everything connects to everything, real, in unreal, superpower, whatever. It's just, yes. it's all connected. And you can get very metaphysical about how it's all connected as well. I'm not going to go there right now. But the <laughs> question of, of the connectivity and where the string theory sort of leads you mm -hmm. is, is really fascinating. And the creative people are overwhelmed by the multiplicity of connections. And it doesn't matter whether they're creative physicists or artists or musicians or dancers, you know, they live in a world of connection. Yeah. And they are sponges for all of the content. And there's something that I believe is intrinsic about that in terms of human capacity. But I think it's intrinsic and then can be easily Disrupt, disrupted or encouraged by early life experiences. Agreed. And, and I'm, I'm unclear whether that's trainable or teachable or something like that. I don't really know yet. I know that um, I used to run a podcast for nine years and I would take notes and do a report back at the end of each podcast. And then I, I trained someone else to run a podcast and, and told her about the process and taking notes and whatever. And at the end of the very first one, uh, she reported back and she said, Jerry, at the end of the call, I looked down on my notepad and I had written nothing. I had not written down a word, which was the point at which I was like, oh, so maybe taking notes during a podcast and keeping the thread and hosting the conversation is sort of a, a skill, right? Well, we didn't have a chance then to develop exercises or a methodology or something to see whether she could, you know, go further there. We didn't, we didn't do more of them, but I was really intrigued by that. I was like, one thing, one thing that that led me to was, and I'll go back here to my brain because I wanted to share. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh shoot, I thought I had it here. Uh, basically, what, what are your superpowers, right? How, because most of us aren't aware of our superpowers. Most of us are not aware. We think everybody else thinks like that um, mm. Mine is synthesis. Uh huh. Synthesis in terms of pulling multiple diverse things together that most people don't even think are connected. That's one of them. Yep. So here we go. Discovering your talents and superpowers needs to go under great design questions. There we go. And this is also next to scaffolding for learners, which I put it nearby. So. Do you have a questionnaire to lead people to their superpowers? I do not. I do not. That would be an interesting thing to develop. At, at a more simple level, there's the book uh, Finding Your Element by Sir Ken Robinson. Uh, it, it, it's, it's primarily focusing on children, but it's written so the, uh, the parents can, can uh, work with the kids around this. It's, it's a wonderful book. It's uh, not specifically around superpowers but it is about finding your element and it, it's got three steps first is uh, interestingly uh, turn down the noise <laughs> because in order to figure out your your talents and your elements you you need to hack yourself back to what we talked about earlier meditation avoiding uh, all the opinions coming from the outside just shut it out for a moment and and then change your perspective is the second step mm -hmm. about, about about mind mapping yours and others assumptions about you and third step is what are you doing do you like what you plan to do or not so I just maybe you want it in your in here as a link and it's not this book the element how finding your passion is it a different book called finding, <coughs> finding your element um, here it is finding your element yeah it is it's a different book right finding here. yeah Finding your element, yeah. Cool, is, thank yeah. you. I will add it right now. The book wonderful, with the title Creative book. Schools looks interesting too. Have you looked at that, Lars? Which one, sorry? There was, there was another one by the same author called Finding 
or something about creative schools was on the cover. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I have, I, I'm a big fan of, of his work. So uh, he, everything he's been writing is so relevant. And uh, it's interestingly, right, he's the most watched TED Talker uh, yep. ever, right? Uh, it, it doesn't come by incident. It's uh, there's something uh, <laughs> the the world knows that we have to uh, to do something about this. Yes and no, because his TED Talk is incredibly popular, and I don't yeah. really see the world swinging toward what our conversation here is about. I think that we still no, have a true. an uphill uh, an uphill climb um, to try Maybe to. Is his joke? He's got some good jokes. Maybe that's what captivates us. I don't know. Yeah. He's giving a clear call to action, right? We have to change this. And jo join me, uh, contact me if, if you want to do something about this. He's very clear in his call to action. Yet, no, we're not seeing much happening, you can say. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so I'll just connect it to discovering your talents and superpowers. So <clears throat> there we go. Um, so let me head back here and it's, it's actually after midnight where you are Lars. So feel free. Do not, do not feel like, uh, we will be insulted if you need to crash and go to, go to sleep. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm good. I wanted to, <laughs> to throw in also the VARC questionnaire, I think it's called, um, what, how do you spell it? Yeah. So the, 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 it's a gentleman named Richard Felder, Richard That's fine. Felder. F E L D E R. Felder. Richard Felder. Huh. Yeah. Got it. You got it. <coughs> so and he has a question. Uh, here we go. Chemical engineering? No. Wrong wrong Richard Felder probably. <coughs> he he could yeah. <coughs> here we go. Sorry. Richard M. Felder probably here. Oh, this he might be the same guy. The, the index of learning styles is what he what he was part of building, <clears throat> which suggests that there are eight learning styles. Uh, <clears throat> and Judith uh, mentioned some of them already. Uh, so it's about being a visual learner, or a verbal learner, or a sequential learner, or reflective learner. Or... There we go. I've, I've never really worked with it, but I... I, I use it in a presentation that I do sometimes. I maybe should try it out someday. <laughs> Very cool. I will add it to learning styles. Um, big, sure, because man. something yeah. we could do offline would be big questions, self-examination questions. Like, mm -hmm. what are the three things in your life you felt best about doing, for instance? If you look at three of them from different settings, are there common elements? That might be your superpower. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so there's probably other ways to come at that, but I think it, exploring the questions might be more important than how you teach the topic. Mm -hmm. If what we want to enable is self-learning, which becomes self-enablement, which becomes self-actualization. Then the discovery is its own reward. Yeah, you know, exactly. <laughs> so here's Felder and here's the index of learning styles. Um, what are we, so what's missing here? What, what other things should, uh, should find a home here? There's, there's, I don't know if enablement is the right word, but some concept that is affirming, a, a universal affirmation concept is, I think, critical to learning. And it's opposite to teaching, which tends to be critical. Hmm. So it's, affirmation of the learners, you mean? Yeah, but it's actually sort of self-affirmation, but it may start out by external affirmation too. The kind of, oh, I think you could do that if you want, if you try. If it doesn't work the first time, try two more, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, whatever. 
but this notion of even with adults i've seen that people don't want to fail mm -hmm. because the system is structured to punish you if you fail and you will intrinsically fail if you're creative it never almost never works the first time you're lucky if something works one out of three in research yeah. <laughs> and this is also something that's very culturally specific um, in Europe, there's not as much tolerance for failures in the U.S. In the U.S., we have all these myths yeah. of the entrepreneur and the bootstrapped everything. In Japan yeah. and Korea and Asia, much, much lower threshold for failure. Um, and, you know, in fact, in Japan still, this, this boggled me to, to realize this recently. Um, in, in Japan, if you go off the beaten path of the job and the career with one company for life, you may not make it back into any of the, any of the big companies. So if you're, if you're a high performance individual and when you're 30 years old, you've got a job at Mitsui Bank, and then you decide to go do a startup for a couple of years, good luck getting hired back at any of the Karetsus. It's yeah, crazy. <clears throat> it's crazy. Yeah. Um, what other questions are we, are we missing here? ironical hiring theory, though, which is to identify those entities you don't like and then hire the people that left them. Hmm. Interesting. Because they were smart enough to get off those ships? Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like that. And a similar paradox is if you're looking for talent, don't call people who think like you and say, who do you know that I could get in touch with? Call people whose style you hate and ask them if they have any people that might fit in your organization. And they'll give you the names of the people they don't like and they're probably the ones you want to talk to. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. It is intentionally creating high diversity teams is the way to success. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so separate, separate from the learning topic, but clearly connected, uh, one of my big fascinations is the, the general friction in the world between political points of view and approaches toward, you know, what's going on. And I had an inside Jerry's brain call two days ago that was like, well, are things getting better or worse? What's, what's up with that? What's the deal? Um, you know, should we be optimistic or pessimistic, uh, liberal or conservative, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that when, I think that, Partly, we don't know who has an opposite point of view to ours because we can't imagine what the actual opposite might really even be because the spectrum in our head, the dimensions in our head are, are this, but it turns out that your opposite is over here. It's not, it's not on the line that you, you draw in your head, maybe. I don't know. And then, yeah. and then in some cases, these differences are so substantial or so profound that those people can't find a way to collaborate. And what you create is chaos. Um, from being, and, and I love diversity and I prize diversity. I'm trying to figure out how do we get people to adventure more with diversity when they probably feel as I'm trying to express right now that, that every now and then that turns into chaos because you're just coming at things from too different a place and you can't find any connecting ground. Hmm. <clears throat> Let me just throw one thing into into that mix there and it's very interesting my my um, seven-year-old linus he um and he's in a small private school and it's so small they don't have really any facilities so they really use the city including theaters and everything it's wonderful um and they just went to the theater yesterday uh, and the, I was asking him, what was it about? And he couldn't really explain it. And his teacher also couldn't explain it. But I found out now uh, that it was about two ladies. Uh, they were very different from each other. Uh, one wanted to make all the decisions and be in the control. And the other ones were struggling. And they had very uh, opposite views of everything. But the, the whole point of this play was that they... They, they actually managed to get along and they could learn so much from each other. And there were many, many good um, stories coming out of this experience. What I want to, to get to is um, theater and, and art can, can be one vehicle to, to let us experience this. Um, so sometimes we also tend to 
revert to the written words and the spoken words, but and it, myself included being a, a bookworm and a mathematician, but I, I, I have really come to appreciate music and, and arts and as a way to to experience, uh, you know, parts of, of life that we never really thought about, including this, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Experience and express in different ways. Yeah. Yeah. Express in different ways. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Linton. Late, but somewhat here. Greetings. Glad to see you. Mm. Sorry, I couldn't catch the rest of this. That's all right. It's been recorded. So if you have any interest, you can go back and listen. I will. I will do that. Yeah. I can share the screen that has been sort of somewhere in the middle of the conversation about some of those great design questions. Uh-huh. Excuse me. I'll, I'll check this. Yep. Um, and we're getting near the end of our 90 minutes. So um, um, what, what closing comments might we each have for the topic? I think there, there are many interesting things to, to, <laughs> to, to touch on as a closing comment. One of them is the way we self-assess if it's about self-learning and self-directed learning, you know, is it is it important to 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 measure our progress at all? It's kind of it's kind of uh, pre-programmed in in my head, but I, I don't like it. I don't like to think about it, and maybe we don't need it. But if we do the self-assessment test, like the personality test that we talked about earlier, I just wanted to mention I found it here the Bertram Fora uh, algorithm, Bertram and then Fora, F-O-R-E-R. Mm -hmm. uh, try to look it up. It, it, this is this is super interesting. Um, and essentially many use it as evidence that you cannot really uh, find any value whatsoever in personality tests because this particular test actually was a hoax. It was like thousands of students over half a century that uh, took this test, and regardless of what they, uh, uh, what they, they how how high they scored on accuracy, right? Uh, it turned out they got the same uh, description. Every student got exactly the same description of their own personality. All of them, thousands and thousands of students. Uh, so do you believe <laughs> that a personality test really uh, works? Uh, so may maybe we just need to appreciate our individual superpowers and our individual ways of learning and, uh, and, and sharing our inspiration with each other and, and give up all about uh, self-assessment and boring stuff like that. So that would be my call to action. Let's just give it up. Let's stop. Just like, let's give up sanity. I did that years ago, and it's yeah. been so easy ever since. Hasn't it? It's so much simpler. <laughs> um, and, and, and I think that, like, learners have a lot to learn from life hackers, for example. Uh, and life hacking can get a little obsessive. But life hacking is people yeah. experimenting with what helps them sleep better, be healthier, learn more, whatever it might be, right? How do they improve their lives? And I think life hacking is a, is a tremendous sort of mainstream uh, act of learning and experimentation with oneself. So I, I like that a lot. Um, and then also, Lars, something I'll ask you, and we, we should sort of talk about this separately in, in terms of the Educate for Life project. But given that I'm trying to set a table like this, how do I frame this for other participants in Educate for Life? Or, and how does this fit? Because I'm pretty familiar with the sprint process. Uh, how, do we make, how do we work this so that it fits nicely in the sprint process? And that we don't have to answer that now. What sort of, uh, I, have, I have the answer, but uh, yeah. Excellent, I love that. I, oh my gosh. I like these pop-up, your idea about the whole pop-up thing. Jerry suddenly uh, comes into, not suddenly, but he will be there for 15 minutes or whatever, agreed. And Jerry will be there. He will uh, facilitate a Jerry's brain thing around whatever topic you're working on. And then Jerry leaves again. And, and you could do that with every team. That's just my, my thought.
That'd be cool. Mm. I'd like that. Um, mm. Judy, any thoughts? I'm sort of intrigued by the notion, I, I popped some stuff into the chat room about interpersonal compatibility and how that affects learning. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, a funny test called the FIRO B. I don't know if you've heard of that. Um, fundamental interpersonal compatibility orientation, but it, it essentially allows for self-assessment along social behaviors of inclusion, control, and affection. And so if you're very individualistic and you don't care about being included, that'll affect how you appear to the group, how you interact with the group, et cetera. It's complicated. Mm -hmm. But it was actually designed for the military for compatibility in close quarters like submarines so that teams didn't self-destruct. And it turned out to be a, a very good learning experience for a leadership team mm -hmm. to do that exercise with a facilitator because we were misinterpreting each other's actions based on what they meant if we did them and not what it meant when the other person did them. So interesting. And, and there's probably a bunch of really interesting angles on this, like the knowledge of the presence of the test might affect group dynamics just, just per se, right? Um, and then there's uh, in Thinking Fast and Slow, Kahneman writes about, in the introduction, he writes about how he was in the Israeli Defense Forces he was part of an elite group of people who were evaluating the next generation of leaders. And they would, they would supervise, they would observe people in very high stress exercises where they had to make you know, life and death decisions. And, and the group that was observing was rating these people for their future leadership potential. And then they did this for years and years. Somebody did a study on the actual outcomes of those people in the field. And then they compared the ratings from the group with the actual outcomes and discovered that there was a correlation of, of nada. There was, basically, there was basically no predictive value in this, in this group's assessments of the, the best leaders in, in these training situations. But that didn't stop this group from continuing to do the same evaluations and rate, <laughs> and, and rate the leaders. They did not take apart this group. They just, they just kept doing it. It's hilarious. It's really good. It's part of the introduction to the book. Um, and I'm like, wow, we are, we are stubborn. And, you know, uh, this is off to the side, but have, have you read the book Ender's Game? Yes. It's been a while, but yes. Um, it's a fascinating model of interpersonal growth from a child to a leadership position. You know, you identify with the protagonist and then you read it a second time through and identify with the people who are trying to influence the development of the protagonist. It's very multi-layered. Um, but it all has to do with different patterns of learning. Mm -hmm. How this chi precocious mm -hmm. child became a leader through a combination of self-directed and, and facilitated learning. Very interesting. Which might fit with your topic somehow in a weird yeah. way. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Cool, I don't think there's much to dig into. Michael, I'm sorry we missed you for the, the bulk of the call. Um, do you You're have any, any, you, right? <laughs> any thoughts as you, as you step through the green world? Uh, well, it's the biggest conundrum, isn't it? Um, how do we know what we don't know and how do we encounter the not knowing of what we don't know before we find out how to know what we might know if we respond? So <clears throat> I think critical inquiry is the key for me. Um, I have to say that I, I've, some of my grandchildren are engaged in an unschooling experiment at this point. And frankly, I'm appalled, not at the concept, but at the practice that um, is being justified by the, you know, the community. Um, so um, I, I'm... I'm sort of Scottish in that area. Uh, <laughs> show, me, show, me, show me the cabbage, you know, like I, I need, uh, I'm, I'm rather didactic. Um, so I didn't realize that Scotland was so close to Missouri. Oh yeah, you know, we, we started it. Huh, <laughs> right. uh, the, show, the show me state. Well, basically Scots are, um, I mean, the invisible hand, uh, Adam Smith's invisible hand was that a Scotsman with some money would prefer to keep it locally invested than sending it down to the stock market. That was all he said. That was his invisible hand, full stop. That was it. An invisible hand would guide him to keep it local, you know. 
Well, I don't think that's a Scottish characteristic particularly. I think just about everywhere it's the same theory. Mind your own business. <laughs> hmm. But, Freedom um, was founded by a Scotsman, um, and his thing was he never wanted bankers on the board. They only give you money when you don't need it, and they won't yeah. do it for you when you do. Mm -hmm. so it was mm -hmm. a self-funded company. So, so um, just uh, my sort of contribution toward wrapping the conversation, um, it was an Adam Smith story, which I happen to like, which is that... Um, Smith, and this I get from Melvin Brown from Berkeley, um, Smith basically uh, was funded by the tobacco lords. His patrons were the very, very wealthy Edinburghians, um, sorry, Glaswegians. Um, and Glasgow was prosperous because of its trade with the Americas. It was the best sheltered port in the British Isles from those damn French and Spaniards. Um, so Glasgow gets very prosperous for three commodities, uh, sugar, tobacco, and cotton. Um, what do these three commodities have in common? Is that Glasgow? Yeah, that's the Clyde. Lovely, lovely. A bunch of paddle steamers and that sort of thing. Yeah. So those three commodities have one thing in common, which is slavery. Yeah. What is the thing that does not factor into Adam Smith's theories of, of capitalism? Slavery. He, he, he sort of... He ignores the very mechanism of his sustenance. Well, yes, quite. Yeah, very carefully. So here's, here's where I have that in my brain. And I'm going to connect it to a thought that I've been curating recently, which is my favorite nuggets in my brain. That we can, I'm going to do an inside Jerry's brain call around this because it's really fun. So these are the things that I believe that I've discovered in lots of different corners. Um, so uh, the Spanish cult of ham was for outing converts, basically, <laughs> which is brilliant. Like you go to a Spanish restaurant, you are sitting under ham that has not been cooked and is dripping on your head. And if you yeah. are either Jewish or Muslim and uh, you know have pretended to convert, <laughs> that's terrible. That would work, yeah, right. And, and that's from the book The Ornament of the World by Rosa Maria Menorcal, or Maria Rosa Menorcal, Menorcal sorry. <clears throat> so anyway, there's a whole bunch of things like that that are, are really, really fun. Um, so we'll do that some other time. Yeah. But um, so here's Love my favorite it. nuggets. What's that other okay. one of yours, Jerry, the sort of uh, outrageous people or... Uh, contrarians. Contrarians. So this is my favorite, um, my favorite thought in my brain is contrarians who make or made sense. And here I have uh, people like Alice Miller, the psychologist, uh, Brene Brown, who talks about uh, vulnerability, uh, Lynn Ostrom and governance of the, of the models of the commons, uh, and a bunch of others, cast of thousands. Uh, George Fox, the founder of the Quakers. So I should, I should do a contrarian's culture. That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Some Michael, would, would you be willing to lead a discussion sometime on the, uh, the challenge of, of critical thinking in contemporary society? God, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no I, I have enough critical capacity to know my limits. Um, no, I'm, I'm a very... Superficial philosopher. Uh huh. Uh huh. I wasn't looking for erudite discussion necessarily, but I think good. <laughs> the absence of critical thinking is one of my hot buttons. Uh -huh. Yes. And yeah. Me too. So here's a note for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Unquestioning acceptance or blind know, blind obedience. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So it's funny because. When I explain design from trust to people, I have to explain, I don't mean naive trust, I don't mean blind trust. Mm -hmm. I mean the presumption that of good intentions by whatever's coming in, but I also mean critical thinking. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. yeah, serious skepticism is uh, sadly missing. And yep. um, that was the, the, ped the pedagogy of the Scottish world was very, Prove it, you know. Show me your evidence, and so on. So I, I'm, I'm sort of attached to that. I think I like uh, Richard Feynman's breakdown of the scientific um, yep. 
bullshit, the cargo cults, the commencement of this. Right? That is, yeah. Feynman is a fascinating guy. Mm -hmm. I really like him. Mm -hmm. Here's a simple parting thought. Yes. Uh, are cynics frustrated idealists? Mm. A lot of them are. Um, I mean, apropos, and no, let's leave this on. I was going to say maybe suppress the recording, but why bother me? <laughs> Douglas Rushkoff. Jerry, you, you know Douglas. Yes, yes, yes. He's recently launched a new agenda, a new direction, Team Human. Yes. On the basis that he's tried money and it doesn't work. He's basically given up on um, systemic reform processes vis-a-vis uh, -vis the financial systems. Mm -hmm. And he's thrown up his hands at it. And that's the problem that I see time and time again, is that people take a good run at something and their head hurts after a while. They don't get a breakthrough. They don't get the success. So they dismiss it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At some level, it becomes... Well, that doesn't work. We're not doing that anymore. And I think that's a big cultural problem. Um, I think it's very deep in North America, and in particular in the U.S. Canadians are a bit more flexible, but Americans, if I may call you that, generally um, tend to sort of think, "Well, we did that. It's done. It's over." You know, and I'm a very prejudicial um, assessment there, but. But I'm, I'm noticing people abandoning ship. I, they, I was on a workshop on Tuesday where they were talking about, we've had it with prevention, we'd better get on with adaption. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're saying. Yeah. And it was so dismal because, frankly, they haven't tried uh, their, uh, their prevention yet. They've just tried the wrong stuff. Let's try something that works. We have a lot, a lot of faulty logic, mm. blind reasoning, a bunch of sort of mismatched ideas going on. The scripts in, in our heads really often are not working well. Yeah. And a part of this was quite intentional because one of my beliefs is that part of what politics tries to do is to put scripts in our heads so that we'll follow their program, not the other guy's program. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of this is how do we spread, how do we create a contagion of critical thinkers who will network together and figure things out at a local level. And hopefully that will cascade upward into better solutions, better policies and a citizenry that's, you know, trustworthy. Well, I'm, I'm sure it's at the local level. I'm sure it's not at the time space differentiated heads in space world that we're in right now. Yeah. Um, for I think I think you have more frequency. You have a higher demand on authenticity in the local scene. In, in a way, what internet has done over the last 20, 30 years is it sucked us all out of the local because it's so much better out there on the wrong tail. With, right. You know? And I'm I'd really like to see all this coming down and local. Um, I got a meeting with one of my local counselors. Uh, local is good. Local is really I'm, good. I think um, local is all. It's nothing else. We are all local, one way. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway. Um, relative to the cynicism as a result of frustrated idealism, the thing I was just looking for in my brain that apparently I did not put in is that a lot of conservatives today, in particular the neocons, were Eugene McCarthy liberals. They, they campaigned for McCarthy back in the day in Wisconsin. They, they were totally into the liberal point of view and something about the 1960s destroyed their brains and flipped them to the other side politically, philosophically. And, and so this is, this is like true with multiple of the neocons. They, they, they started liberal and they flipped. They got cynical, they got burned, whatever it was. It was the summer of love. It was, I don't know what it was, but, but something in the 60s broke their faith in humanity and switch their reasoning or the scripts in their heads around this. And I'm, I'm very intrigued by this. Um, I just finished reading Red and Blue States uh, by Steve Kornacki, which is a really good history of uh, Gingrich and Clinton and the politics of, of destruct, personal destruction and how, how political discourse got so blighted, so separated. And a lot of it really rests at the foot of Newt Gingrich, <laughs> um, who, who systematically went and destroyed 
uh, the two sides' ability to talk to each other. So anyway, lots of things. Uh, we should uh, let Lars get some sleep. Any any last thoughts, Lars? I just want to say thank you so much for hanging out with me on a Friday night. Yeah. It's been wonderful to see you all, uh, Michael. It didn't. We didn't have much time here together, but some yeah. other time. Yeah. Yes. It's always uh, another chance. Well, I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> and and Lars, if you ever want to build an inside Jerry's brain call around one or both of your kids, happy to do that on any topic they'd like. Cool. Cool. Let's yeah. do that. Yeah. It would be wonderful to go across the generations that way. Yes, it would. That would be amazing. That would be. So, if you want to show them what a call is like and mention it, I'm, I'd be happy. Cool. Done deal. All right, kids. <laughs> have a great weekend. Yeah. Thank Everyone you. Have a good weekend. Very good. Thank you. Have a good bye -bye. one. Bye-bye, everyone. Judith, Jerry, Michael. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye.